York Jets wildcard confrontation with New England produced both heroism and heartbreak. Number 10, Pat Ryan, performed heroically in relief of battered Ken O'Brien, but the team that had committed the fewest turnovers in the AFC gave the ball away four times. While this 26 to 14 loss to the eventual AFC champions was disappointing, it could not diminish the dramatic turnaround made by a squad coming off consecutive seven and nine campaigns. Throughout the season, the Jets made it clear that something promising was taking shape. motivational efforts made his Jets believe in themselves. We can go all the way to New Orleans if you want to. Just stay together. The Jets didn't get to New Orleans, but they did stay together, and together they opened the door to a bright future. After an opening day 31 to nothing defeat to the Los Angeles Raiders, the Jets came home and set the tempo for their season. They blasted Buffalo 42 to three as Freeman McNeil number 24 ran for a pair of touchdowns. The following week, number 49 Tony Page's two scores helped pace a 24 to three victory in Green Bay. With Dave Jennings placing six punts inside the 20, the Packers were continually frustrated by poor field position. The special teams also foiled a fake punt, and the resulting fumble was transformed into a touchdown by Tom Baldwin, number 95. The Jets' next victory was preserved by a tenacious late-game defensive stand. So this is uh, the play of the game so far coming up. Fourth and less than a yard for the Indianapolis Colts. Can the Jets stop the Colts? Pagel gets the snap. He gives it to Bentley. He, he didn't make it. it. The Jets have stopped the Colts. Cincinnati was the next to fall during a winning streak that proved the Jets program was paying off. Joe Walton now had his kind of players, tough guys who bore the marks of a fighting spirit. They were hard workers who preferred to battle in the dust rather than bask in the limelight. These players reminded Walton of... A lot of blue collar workers. They don't mind working hard. And uh, I, I like that quality in, uh, in an individual and I like that quality in my team. That quality was embodied in team captain Joe Fields. In his 11th pro season, Fields, number 65, again demonstrated why he is one of the NFL's most respected centers. The Jets' work ethic was also represented by wide receiver Kurt Sohn, number 87, who had caught just two passes during an injury-plagued four-year career. Sohn produced 39 receptions in 1985 as he seized upon every opportunity to realize his dream of succeeding in the pros. Like Zone, Johnny Hector, number 34, was a clutch performer who responded when the Jets needed him most. Down the stretch run toward the playoffs, the determined Hector scored five touchdowns in the season's final six games. The determination of number 49, Tony Page, was most evident near the end zone, and his 10 touchdowns led the team. On defense, linebacker Kyle Clifton, number 59, the team leader in tackles, typified the Jets' blue-collar contingent 
as did linebacker Bob Crable, number 50, who rebounded from a serious knee injury to become a late season starter. A former truck driver named Joe Klecko muscled his way past roadblocks. And in his first ever season at nose tackle, number 73 drove opponents into the ground. Klecko's desire to succeed is molded by his working class origins. I don't get away from the things that made me. I don't, I don't forget why, I, why I'm here. I don't forget how I got here. I don't get reward in headlines, you know. I get reward when I watch a game film and I know I've done well. For me, that's a work ethic. Klecko will get down on his hands and knees to polish off a quarterback. Joe Klecko became the first defensive player in NFL history to make the Pro Bowl at three different positions. While he was the workhorse of the defense, Freeman McNeil, number 24, was the racehorse of the offense. The season began with McNeil off and running to the best start of his career. Despite missing two full games, McNeil broke his own single season rushing record with 1,331 yards and was voted a Pro Bowl starter for the second straight year. With his incredible balance, McNeil suggests a man calmly navigating his way through a windstorm while objects fly past him. McNeil produced the AFC's two highest single game rushing performances of 1985. His 192 yards against Buffalo in week two was a team record, and he tunneled his way for 173 yards in a six-week encounter with Miami on Monday night. The offensive line of Marvin Powell, Reggie McElroy, Joe Fields, Jim Sweeney, and Dan Alexander formed a wall that neutralized the Dolphin defense. Line allowed just one sack in a 23-7 victory, and this fifth consecutive win left the Jets in sole possession of first place in the AFC East. Non-stop defensive pressure resulted in Dan Marino's lowest numbers as an NFL starter, and hard-hitting defense garnered the spotlight two weeks later when Seattle was limited to a mere 68 net yards in the second half. Against a team they had never beaten in seven tries, the Jets erased a 14 to nothing deficit as they bounced back from a loss at New England. McNeil contributed 151 yards and a touchdown to this 17 to 14 victory. The game winning score was produced by Ken O'Brien and Wesley Walker. O'Brien back to pass over the middle, touchdown! A pass to Wesley Walker in heavy traffic. The, the Jets, Jets had ended the Seahawk jinx, and they concluded the season's first half with a 6-2 record that placed them atop the AFC East. An October Monday night was illuminated by one of pro football history's shining stars. Joe Namath, a 1985 inductee into the Hall of Fame was honored by his former coach, Hall of Famer, Wee Bubank, and by over 73,000 fans. Broadway Joe's number 12 became the first jersey to be retired by the New York Jets. While Joe Namath earned himself a place in the game's gallery of greats, a young passing artist named Ken O'Brien struck a portrait of confidence and asserted his own competitive identity throughout 1985. This smooth operator was skilled at placing long distance calls and his 96 yarder to Wesley Walker became the longest pass play in team history. In only his first full season as a starter, O'Brien threw for 25 touchdowns against just eight interceptions, while becoming the first Jet to ever win the NFL's passer rating title.
In 1985, Ken O'Brien provided the Jets with a strong arm and strong leadership. He's just a positive image and a positive leader, and he has made our receivers a potential threat every time they come off the line of scrimmage. Wide receivers Wesley Walker, number 85, and Al Toon, number 88, formed an imposing pair of targets for O'Brien. While Toon, a number one draft choice, became a starter in the last seven games of the season by displaying the poise of a veteran, ninth-year pro Wesley Walker hustled with the enthusiasm of a rookie. Long known for outrunning defenders, Walker demonstrated that he could outmuscle them as well. For the second straight season, tight end Mickey Schuler, number 82, was the Jets' most productive pass catcher. Schuler's seven touchdowns topped all NFL tight ends, and his 76 receptions broke George Sauer Jr.'s 19-year-old club record. The receiving core also included two players who doubled as return men. Kickoff return leader Bobby Humphrey, number 84, benefited from the solid special teams play of Marion Barber, Tom Baldwin, and Rocky Cleaver. The punt return leader was versatile Kurt Sohn, number 87, whose inspirational comeback from injury enabled him to write one of the team's biggest success stories in 1985. The Jets' well-balanced attack spelled trouble for opponents and flashed brilliantly throughout the season. But in Week 10 at Miami, the Jets were burned by uncharacteristic mistakes during the early going. After a frustrating first half, Ken O'Brien rallied the Jets from behind. With 106 remaining to play, a touchdown pass to tight end Rocky Cleaver, number 89, produced a 17 to 14 lead. But 17 seconds later, it was the Dolphins who engineered the game's most dramatic play. Yet this was a season in which the Jets never lost two games in succession and the following week found them walking tall once again. Against Tampa Bay, Ken O'Brien conducted a clinic in how to exploit a defense by throwing five touchdown passes, three of them to Mickey Schuler. Here's O'Brien back to pass, straight down the middle, touchdown to Mickey Schuler. O'Brien on second and eight, and he throws it into the end zone for the touchdown. O'Brien looking uh, to the five, a good diving grab by Schuler, and he dives into the end zone. Touchdown, Mickey Schuler with a great effort. Al Toon's 78-yard catch and run highlighted a 62-28 win, and those 62 points established a team record, as well as an NFL season high for 1985. The shutdown of Tampa Bay was followed by a showdown with New England. In this battle for first place in the AFC East, neither team scored a touchdown until the third period, when Ken O'Brien and Wesley Walker combined on an 88-yard scoring play. But on this day, it was defense that dominated. And while New England eventually evened matters at 13 apiece, five jet sacks helped prevent the Patriots from taking the lead. In overtime, place kicker Pat Leahy, enjoying his best season, provided the margin of victory after Kurt Sohn's clutch punt return. A high, booming punt. Sohn's under at the 40. Sohn cuts to the left side, to the 50. He dances to the 45, to the 40. 35 to the 30 to the 20. He takes it down to the 15. Bumped out of bounds inside the 15 yard line. What a run back by Kurt Zone. A 33 yard field goal attempt for first place in the AFC East. Here comes the snap. Here comes the kick. It is up. It is good. And the New York Jets are in first place in the AFC East. They have defeated the New England Patriots in overtime 16 to 
to 13. This game offered a forceful reminder of how far the Jets had progressed from a season ago when they had faltered after a fine first half. Joe Walton's close-knit squad now boasted a division-leading 9-3 and record and was poised for a run at the playoffs. Throughout the season, the New York Jets turned the world upside down for their loyal fans. In the wake of the team's resurgence came the greening of the Meadowlands. An important factor in the Jets' success was a new defensive system that players studied hard to master. Linebacker Lance Mell, number 56, thrived in this new scheme. His role in the AFC's least scored upon defense earned him first time Pro Bowl honors. We didn't blitz a lot in the past, and uh, as a result, he didn't get a lot of sacks and a lot of uh, uh, publicity for that type of thing. This year, people are seeing that he can also blitz, and maybe he won't go unrecognized too much longer. The thing you never realize about Lance Mell is uh, how strong he is and what a great game day player he is. He can play hurt. He's going to be there all the time. He's one of the best tacklers I've ever seen. Very tough football player. A lot of that can rub off on other people and help you build a good defense. Bud Carson's first season as defensive coordinator saw him orchestrate a 3-4 alignment that kept opponents guessing. It featured a nose tackle who slanted toward center and a pass rusher who often stood over tackle. The blitz also became an effective weapon. Defensive backs Russell Carter, number 27, and Lester Lyles, number 26. Linebackers Rusty Gilbo, number 94, and Charles Jackson, number 55, were part of an aggressive unit that implemented Carson's strategies. It's a whole new defense for us. Everybody's facing a new challenge. It's been a lot of fun. Bud's definitely the, the main reason. You know, he's, he's put in a more aggressive defense, and, and the guys are just flying around, and everybody's having a good time. The Jets forced a team record 42 fumbles and posted the best turnover ratio in the AFC despite an injury-ravaged secondary that forced Carson to use eight different starters. Number 29, Johnny Lynn, Russell Carter, and Kirk Springs, number 21, made substantial contributions to the defensive backfield, as did Rich Miano, number 36, and Bobby Jackson, number 40. Number 39, Harry Hamilton. Number 20, Davlin Mullen. And surprising 10th round draft choice, Kerry Glenn, number 35, met the challenge of teams that were continually forced to throw against the Jets, who fielded the AFC's best rushing defense. The Jets' pressure-packed pass rush produced 49 sacks as number 73 Joe Klecko, Marty Lyons, number 93, and Barry Bennett, number 78, paced the pursuit and punishment of quarterbacks. Number 99, Mark Gastineau, missed four starts, but led the team with 13 and a half sacks. Gastineau's relentless intensity makes him the terminator among NFL pass rushers. In addition to charging quarterbacks, Mark Gastineau also charges up a crowd like few players can. But in 1985, the entire Jet squad fired up their fans. 45 players were maturing together. They created a unique team chemistry. The team has grown up a little bit more. We're coming together a little bit. We still have some growing pains to go. We're not all the way there yet, but we're getting there. Growing pains were felt in a 31 to 20 Thanksgiving Day defeat in Detroit. Two weeks later, the Jets ran up against the eventual Super Bowl champion Chicago Bears and suffered a 19 to six loss that knocked them out of the division lead. The Jets were now part of a complicated playoff picture, but in the season's final week against the visiting Cleveland Browns, they simplified matters considerably. Six 
16 weeks together. Let's kick through it. Come on, let's go. Led by a rampaging Mark Gastineau, the defense cornered Cleveland in key situations, and a 7-3 deficit was eventually erased by a touchdown play that symbolized the determination and spirit of the 1985 Jets. Now here's O'Brien, back to pass, looking long. He heaves it down the middle, and it's going to be intercepted. And then grabbed away by Sony, runs into the end zone for the touchdown! Don Rogers had the ball, and then it was ripped away. Unbelievable. Defense! Defense! Come on, Bob, get in there, Bob! When Gastineau ran the gauntlet to force a Bernie Kosar fumble, the resulting takeaway set up a Johnny Hector touchdown that gave the Jets a 17-10 halftime lead. Handoff goes to Johnny Hector. He slashes to the five, to the four, to the three, to the two. Touchdown, Johnny Hector! Yes, yes, yes. The second half belonged exclusively to the Jets, as number 82 Mickey Schuler's eight catches enabled him to become the Jets' all-time single-season reception leader. Ken O'Brien withstood constant pressure to direct a ball control attack that spearheaded victory. Come on, Johnny! Hand off Hector, he goes airborne, touchdown! A 37 to 10 win cemented an 11 and five regular season record that propelled the Jets into the playoffs for the third time in the last five years especially heartening about one of the most exciting campaigns in team history was that it was undertaken by a blend of young players and seasoned pros. What they accomplished together forcefully suggests that 1985 was just the beginning.